foundations of human history, of all that man enjoyed, of all that man has suffered, his victories and defeats, all that he has lost and won. Words are the shadows of all that has been, they are the mirrors of all that is. The ghosts also enlightened our fathers in astronomy and geology. According to them the world was made out of nothing, and a little more nothing having been taken than was used in the construction of the world, the stars were made out of the scraps that were left over. Cosmos, in the sixth century, taught that the stars were impelled by angels who carried them upon their shoulders, rolled them in front of them, or drew them after. He also taught that each angel who pushed a star took great pains to observe what the other angels were doing, so that the relative distances between the stars might always remain the same. He stated that this world was a vast body of water with a strip of land on the outside, that Adam and Eve lived on the outer strip, that their descendants were drowned on the outer strip, all except Noah and his family. He accounted for night and day by saying that on the outer strip of land was a mountain around which the sun revolved, producing darkness when it was hidden from sight and daylight when it emerged. He also declared the earth to be flat. This he proved by many passages from the Bible. Among other reasons for believing the earth to be flat, he referred to a passage in the New Testament which says that Christ shall come again in glory and power, and every eye shall see him, and said, Now if the world is round, how are the people on the other side going to see Christ when he comes? That settled the question, and the church not only endorsed this book, but declared that whoever believed either less or more was a heretic, and would be dealt with as such. In those blessed days ignorance was a king, and science was an outcast. The church knew that the moment the earth ceased to be the center of the universe, and became a mere speck in the starry sphere of existence, every religion would become a thing of the past. In the name and by the authority of the ghosts, men enslaved their fellow men, they trampled upon the rights of women and children. In the name and by the authority of ghosts, they bought and sold each other, they filled heaven with tyrants and the earth with slaves, they filled the present with intolerance and the future with horror. In the name and by the authority of the ghosts, they declared superstition to be the real religion. In the name and by the authority of the ghosts, they imprisoned the human mind, they polluted the conscience, they subverted justice, and they sainted hypocrisy. I have endeavored in some degree to show you what has been and always will be when men are governed by superstition. When they destroy the sublime standard of reason, when they take the words of others and do not investigate them themselves, even the great men of those days appear nearly as weak as the most ignorant. One of the greatest men of the world, an astronomer second to none, discoverer of the three great laws that explain the solar system, was an astrologer, and believed that he could predict the career of a man by finding what star was in the ascendant at his birth. He believed in what is called the music of the spheres, and he ascribed the qualities of the music, alto, bass, tenor, and treble, to certain of the planets. Another man kept an idiot whose words he put down and then put them together in such a manner as to make promises, and waited patiently to see that they were fulfilled. Luther believed he had actually seen the devil, and discussed points of theology with him. The human mind was enchained. Every idea almost was a mystery. Facts were looked upon as worthless. Only the wonderful was worth preserving. Devils were thought to be the most industrious beings in the universe, and with these imps every occurrence of an unusual character was connected. There was no order, certainty, everything depended upon ghosts and phantoms, and man for the most part considered himself at the mercy of malevolent spirits. 
he protected himself as best he could with holy water and with tapers and wafers and cathedrals he made noises to frighten the ghosts and music to charm them he fasted when he was hungry and he feasted when he was not he believed everything unreasonable he humbled himself he crawled in the dust he shut the doors and windows and excluded every ray of light from his soul and he delayed not a day to repair the walls of his own prison and from the garden of the human heart they plucked and trampled into the bloody dust the flowers and blossoms they denounced man as totally depraved they made reason blasphemy they made pity a crime nothing so delighted them as painting the torments and tortures of the damned over the worm that never dies they grew poetic according to them the cries ascending from hell were the perfume of heaven they divided the world into saints and sinners and all the saints were going to heaven and all the sinners yonder now then you stand in the presence of a great disaster a house is on fire and there is seen at a window the frightened face of a woman with a babe in her arms appealing for help humanity cries out will some one go to the rescue they do not ask for a methodist a baptist or a catholic they ask for a man all at once there starts from the crowd one that nobody ever suspected of being a saint one may be with a bad reputation but he goes up the ladder and is lost in the smoke and flame and a moment after he emerges and the great circles of flame hiss around him in a moment more he has reached the window in another moment with the woman and child in his arms he reaches the ground and gives his fainting burden to the bystanders and the people all stand hushed for a moment as they always do at such times and then the air is rent with acclamations tell me that that man is going to be sent to hell to eternal flames who is willing to risk his life rather than a woman and child should suffer from the fire one moment i despise that doctrine of hell any man that believes in eternal hell is afflicted with at least two diseases petrifaction of the heart and petrifaction of the brain i have seen upon the field of battle a boy sixteen years of age struck by a fragment of a shell i have seen him fall i have seen him die with a curse upon his lips and the face of his mother in his heart tell me that his soul will be hurled from the field of battle where he lost his life that his country might live where he lost his life for the liberties of man tell me that he will be hurled from that field to eternal torment i pronounce it an infamous lie and yet according to these gentlemen that is to be the fate of nearly all the splendid fellows in this world i had in my possession a little while ago a piece of fresco that used to adorn a church at stratford-on-avon the place where shakespeare lived and there was a picture representing the morning of the resurrection and people were getting out of their graves and devils were grabbing them by their heels and there was an immense monster with jaws open so wide that a man could walk down its throat and the flames were issuing therefrom and there were devils driving people in droves down the throat of this monster and there was an immense kettle in which they had put these men and the fire was being stirred under it and hot pitch was being poured on top and little devils were setting it on fire and then on the walls there were hundreds hung up by their tongues to hooks and nails and then the saved there were some five or six saved upon the horizon and they had a most self-satisfied grin of i told you so at the risk of being tiresome i have said that i have to show the direction of the human mind in slavery the effects of a widespread ignorance and the result of fear i want to convince you that every form of slavery physical or mental is a viper that will finally fill with poison the breast of any man alive i want to show you that there should be republicanism in the domain of thought as well as in civil government the first step towards progress is for man to cease to be the slave of the creatures of his creation 
men found at last that the event is more valuable than the prophecy especially if it never comes to pass they found that diseases were not produced by spirits that they could not be cured by frightening them away they found that death was as natural as life they began to study the anatomy and chemistry of the human body, and they found that all was natural, and the conjurer and the sorcerer were dismissed, and the physician and surgeon were employed. They learned that being born under a star or planet had nothing to do with their luck. The astrologer was discharged, and the astronomer took his place. They found that the world had swept through the constellation for millions of ages. They found that diseases were produced as easily as grass, and were not sent as punishment on men for failing to believe a creed. They found that man, through intelligence, could take advantage of the affairs of its nature, that he could make the waves, the winds, the flames, and the lightnings slaves at his bidding to administer to his wants they found the ghosts knew nothing of benefit to man, that they were entirely ignorant of history, that they were bad doctors and worse surgeons, that they knew nothing of the law and less of justice, that they were poor politicians, that they were tyrants, and that they were without brains and utterly destitute of hearts. The condition of this world during the Dark Ages shows exactly the result of enslaving the souls of men. In those days there was no liberty. Liberty was despised, and the laborer was considered but little above the beast. Ignorance like a vast cowl covered the brain of the world. Superstition ran riot, and credulity sat upon the throne of the soul murder and hypocrisy were the companions of man and industry was a slave every country maintained that it was no robbery to take the property of mohammedans by force and no murder to kill the owner lord bacon was the first man who maintained that a christian country was bound to keep its plighted faith with a mohammedan nation Every man who could read or write was suspected of being a heretic in those days. Only one person in forty thousand could read or write. All thought was discouraged. The whole earth was ruled by the mitre and scepter, by the altar and throne, by fear and force, by ignorance and faith, by ghouls and ghosts. In the fifteenth century the following law was in force in England. Whosoever reads the scripture in the mother tongue shall forfeit land, cattle, life, and goods for themselves and their heirs forever, and should be condemned for heretics to God, enemies to the crown, and traitors to the land. During the period this law was in force, thirty-nine were hanged and their bodies burned. In the sixteenth century men were burned because they failed to kneel to a procession of monks, even the reformers so-called had no idea of liberty only when in the minority the moment they were clothed with power they began to exterminate with fire and sword castillo and i want you to recollect it was the first minister in the world that declared in favor of universal toleration castillo was pursued by john calvin like a wild beast Calvin said that by such a monstrous doctrine he crucified Christ afresh, and they pursued that man until he died. Recollect it. They can't do that nowadays. You don't know how splendid I feel about the liberty I have. The horizon is filled with glory, and the air is filled with wings. If there are any in this world who think they had better not tell what they really think, because it will take bread from their little children, because it will take clothing from their families, don't do it. Don't make martyrs of yourselves. I don't believe in martyrdom. Go right along with them. Go to church and say amen as near the right place as you can. I will do your talking for you. They can't take the bread away from me. I will talk. Bodemus, a lawyer of France, wrote a few words in favor of freedom of conscience. Montaigne was the first to raise his voice against torture in France. 
but what was the voice of one man against the terrible cry of ignorant infatuated malevolent millions i intend to do what little i can and i am going to do it kindly i am going to appeal to reason and to charity to justice to science and to the future for my part i glory in the fact that in the new world in the united states liberty of conscience was first granted to man and that the constitution of the united states was the first great decree entered in the high court of human equity forever divorcing church and state it is the grandest step ever taken by the human race and the declaration of independence was the first document that retired ghosts from politics it is the first document that said authority does not come from the phantoms of the air authority is not from that direction it comes from the people themselves the declaration of independence enthroned man and dethroned the phantoms you will ask what has caused this change in three hundred years i answer the inventions and discoveries of the few the brave thoughts and heroic utterances of the few the acquisition of a few facts getting acquainted with our mother nature besides this you must remember that every wrong in some way tends to abolish itself it is hard to make a lie last always a lie will not fit the truth it will only fit another lie told on purpose to fit it nothing but truth lives the nobles and kings quarrelled the priests began to dispute and the millions began to get their rights in fourteen forty one printing was discovered at that time the past was a vast cemetery without an epitaph the ideas of men had mostly perished in the brains that had produced them printing gives an opening for thought it preserves ideas it made it possible for a man to bequeath to the world the wealth of his thoughts about the same time or a little before the moors had gone into europe and it can be truthfully said that science was thrust into the brain of europe upon the point of a moorish lance they gave us paper and what is printing without paper a bird without wings i tell you paper has been a splendid thing the discovery of america whose shores were trod by the restless feet of adventure and the people of every nation out of this strange mingling of facts and fancies came the great republic every fact has pushed a superstition from the brain and a ghost from the cloud every mechanical art is an educator every loom every reaper every mower every steamboat every locomotive every engine every press every telegraph is a missionary of science and an apostle of progress every mill every furnace with its wheels and levers in which something is made for the convenience for the use and the comfort and the well-being of man is my kind of church and every schoolhouse is a temple education is the most radical thing in this world to teach the alphabet is to inaugurate a revolution to build a schoolhouse is to construct a fort every library is an arsenal filled with the weapons and ammunition of progress every fact is a monitor with sides of iron and a turret of steel i thank the inventors and discoverers i thank columbus and magellan i thank locke and hume bacon and shakespeare i thank fulton and watt franklin and morse who made the lightning the messenger of man i thank luther for protesting against the abuses of the church but denounce him because he was an enemy of liberty i thank calvin for writing a book in favor of religious freedom but i abhor him because he burned servetus i thank the puritans for saying that resistance to tyrants is obedience to god and yet i am compelled to admit that they were tyrants themselves 
i thank thomas paine because he was a believer in liberty i thank voltaire that great man who for half a century was the intellectual monarch of europe and who from his throne at the foot of the alps pointed the finger of scorn at every hypocrite in christendom i thank the inventors i thank the discoverers the thinkers and the scientists and i thank the honest millions who have toiled i thank the brave men with brave thoughts they are the atlases upon whose broad and mighty shoulders rests the grand fabric of civilization they are the men who have broken and are still breaking the chains of superstition we are beginning to learn that to swap off a superstition for a fact to ascertain the real is to progress all that gives us better bodies and minds and clothes and food and pictures grander music better heads better hearts and that makes us better husbands and wives and better citizens all these things combined produce what we call the progress of the human race man advances only as he overcomes the obstacles of nature it is done by labor and thought labor is the foundation without great labor it is impossible to progress without labor on the part of those who conduct all great industries of life of those who battle with the obstacles of the sea on the part of the inventors the discoverers and the brave heroic thinkers no surplus is produced and from the surplus produced by labor spring the schools and universities the painters the sculptors the poets the hopes the loves and the aspirations of the world the surplus has given us the books it has given us all there is of beauty and eloquence i am aware there is a vast difference of opinion as to what progress is and that many denounce my ideas i know there are many worshippers of the past they see no beauty in anything from which they do not blow the dust of ages with the breath of praise they see nothing like the ancients no orators poets or statesmen like those who have been dust for thousands of years in a sermon on a certain evening some time ago the rev dr mcgee of albany new york stated that colonel ingersoll referring to jesus christ called him a dirty little jew i denounce that as a dirty little lie i have as much reverence for any man who ever did what he believed was right and died in order to benefit mankind as any man in this world do they treat an opponent with fairness are they investigating do they pull forward or do they hold back is science indebted to the church for a single fact let us know what it is what church has been the asylum for a persecuted truth what reform has been inaugurated by the church did the church abolish slavery no who commenced it such men as garrison and pillsbury and wendell phillips they were the titans that attacked the monster and not a solitary one of them ever belonged to a church has the church raised its voice against war no are men restrained by superstition are men restrained by what you call religion i used to think they were not now i admit they are no man has ever been restrained from the commission of a real crime but from an artificial one he has there was a man who committed murder they got the evidence but he confessed that he did it what did you do it for money did you get any money yes how much fifteen cents what kind of man was he a laboring man i killed what did you do with the money i bought liquor with it did he have anything else i think he had some meat and bread what did you do with that i ate the bread and threw away the meat it was friday so you see it will restrain in some things just to the extent that man has freed himself from the dominion of ghosts he has advanced to that extent he has freed himself from the tyrant's poison man has found that he must give liberty to others in order to have it himself 
he has found that a master is a slave, that a tyrant is also a slave. He has found that governments should be administered by men for men, that the rights of all are to be protected, that woman is at least the equal for man, that men existed before books, that all creeds were made by men, that the few have a right to contradict what the pulpit asserts, that man is responsible to himself and to others. True religion must be free. Without liberty, the brain is a dungeon and the mind a convict. The slave may bow and cringe and crawl, but he cannot worship. He cannot adore. True religion is the perfume of the free and grateful air. True religion is the subordination of the passions to the intellect. It is not a creed. It is a life. The theory that is afraid of investigation is not deserving of a place in the human mind. I do not pretend to tell what all the truth is. I do not pretend to have fathomed the abyss, nor to have floated on outstretched wings level with the heights of thought. I simply plead for freedom. I denounce the cruelties and horrors of slavery. I ask for light and air for the souls of men. I say, take off those chains, break those manacles, free those limbs, release that brain. I plead for the right to think, to reason, to investigate. I ask that the future may be enriched with the honest thoughts of men. I implore every human being to be a soldier in the army of progress. I will not invade the rights of others. You have no right to erect your toll-gates upon the highways of thought. You have no right to leap from the hedges of superstition and strike down the pioneers of the human race. You have no right to sacrifice the liberties of man upon the altars of ghosts. Believe what you may, preach what you desire, have all the forms and ceremonies you please, exercise your liberties in your own way, and extend to all others the same right. I attack the monsters, the phantoms of imagination that have ruled the world. I attack slavery. I ask for room, room for the human mind. Why should we sacrifice a real world that we have for one we know not of? Why should we enslave ourselves? Why should we forge fetters for our own hands? Why should we be the slaves of phantoms, phantoms that we create ourselves? The darkness of barbarism was the womb of these shadows. In the light of science they cannot cloud the sky forever. They have reddened the hands of man with innocent blood. They made the cradle a curse and the grave a place of torment. They blinded the eyes and stopped the ears of the human race. They subverted all the ideas of justice by promising infinite rewards for finite virtues and threatening infinite punishment for finite offenses. I plead for light, for air, for opportunity. I plead for individual independence. I plead for the rights of labor and of thought. I plead for a chainless future. Let the ghosts go. Justice remains. Let them disappear. Men, women, and children are left. Let the monster fade away. The world remains, with its hills and seas and plains, with its seasons of smiles and frowns, its springs of leaf and bud, its summer of shade and flower, its autumn with the laden boughs, when the withered banners of the corn are still, and gathered fields are growing strangely wan, while death, poetic death, with hands that color whate'er they touch, weaves in the autumn wood her tapestries of gold and brown. The world remains, with its winters and homes and firesides, where grow and bloom the virtues of our race. All these are left, and music, with its sad and thrilling voice, and all there is of art and song and hope and love and aspiration high. 
all these remain let the ghosts go we will worship them no more man is greater than these phantoms humanity is grander than all the creeds than all the books humanity is the great sea and these creeds and books and religions are but the waves of a day humanity is the sky and these religions and dogmas and theories are but the mists and clouds changing continually destined finally to melt away let the ghosts go we will worship them no more let them cover their eyeless sockets with their fleshless hands and fade forever from the imaginations of men End of Ingersoll's Lecture on Ghosts This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. This has been the second lecture from Lectures of Colonel R. G. Ingersoll, read for you by Ted Lorm in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during April 2007. Saul's Lecture on Hell, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. Lecture number 3, Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell. Ladies and gentlemen, the idea of a hell was born of revenge and brutality on the one side, and cowardice on the other in my judgment the american people are too brave too charitable too generous too magnanimous to believe in the infamous dogma of an eternal hell i have no respect for any human being who believes in it i have no respect for the man who will pollute the imagination of childhood with that infamous lie i have no respect for the man who will add to the sorrows of this world with the frightful dogma I have no respect for any man who endeavors to put that infinite cloud, that infinite shadow, over the heart of humanity. I want to be frank with you. I dislike this doctrine. I hate it. I despise it. I defy this doctrine. For a good many years the learned intellects of Christendom have been examining into the religions of other countries in the world, the religions of the thousands that have passed away. They examined into the religions of Egypt, the religion of Greece, the religion of Rome, and of the Scandinavian countries. In the presence of the ruins of those religions, the learned men of Christendom insisted that those religions were baseless, that they are fraudulent, but they have all passed away. While this was being done, the Christianity of our day applauded, and when the learned men got through with the religions of other countries, they turned their attention to our religion. By the same mode of reasoning, by the same methods, by the same arguments that they used with the old religions, they were overturning the religion of our day. Why? Every religion in this world is the work of man. Every one. Every book has been written by man men existed before the books if books had existed before man i might admit there was such a thing as a sacred volume in my judgment man has made every religion and made every book there is another thing to which i wish to call your attention man never had an idea man will never have an idea except those supplied to him by his surroundings every idea in the world that man has came to him by nature man cannot conceive of anything the hint of which you have not received from your surroundings you can imagine an animal with the hoof of a bison with the pouch of the kangaroo with the wings of an eagle with the beak of a bird and with the tail of the lion and yet every point of this monster you borrowed from nature everything you can think of everything you can dream of is borrowed from your surroundings everything and there is nothing on this earth coming from any other sphere whatever. Man has produced every religion in the world. And why? Because each generation bodes forth the knowledge and the belief of the people at the time it was made. 
and in no book is there any knowledge found except that of the people who wrote it in no book is there found any knowledge except that of the time in which it was written barbarians have produced and always will produce barbarian religions barbarians have produced and always will produce ideas in harmony with their surroundings and all the religions of the past were produced by barbarians every one of them we are making religions today we are making religions tonight that is to say we are changing them and the religion of today is not the religion of one year ago what changed it science has done it education and the growing heart of man has done it we are making these religions every day and just to the extent that we become civilized ourselves will we improve the religion of our fathers if the religion of one hundred years ago compared with the religion of today is so low what will it be in one thousand years if we continue making the inroads upon orthodoxy which we have been making during the last twenty-five years what will it be fifty years from tonight it will have to be remonetized by that time or else it will not be legal tender in my judgment every religion that stands by appealing to miracles is dishonor every religion in the world has denounced every other religion as a fraud that proves to me that they all tell the truth about others why suppose mr smith should tell mr brown that he smith saw a corpse get out of the grave and that when he first saw it it was covered with the worms of death and that in his presence it was reclothed in healthy beautiful flesh and then suppose mr brown should tell mr smith i saw the same thing myself i was in a graveyard once and i saw a dead man rise suppose then that smith should say to brown you're a liar and brown should reply to smith and you're a liar what would you think it would simply be because smith never having seen it himself didn't believe brown and brown never having seen it didn't believe smith had now if smith had really seen it and brown told him he had seen it too then smith would regard it as a corroboration of his story and he would regard brown as one of his principal witnesses but on the contrary he says you never saw it so when a man says i was upon mount sinai and there i met god and he told me stand aside and let me drown these people and another man says to him i was upon a mountain and there i met the supreme brahma and moses says that's not true and contends that the other man never did see brahma and he contends that moses never did see god that is in my judgment proof that they both speak truly every religion then has charged every other religion with having been an unmitigated fraud and yet if any man had ever seen the miracle himself his mind would be prepared to believe that another man had seen the same thing whenever a man appeals to a miracle he tells what is not true truth relies upon reason and the undeviating course of all the laws of nature now we have a religion that is some people have i do not pretend to have religion myself i believe in living for this world that's my doctrine in living here now today tonight that's my doctrine to make everybody happy that you can now let the future take care of itself and if i ever touch the shores of another world i will be just as ready and anxious to get into some remunerative employment as anybody else now we have got in this country a religion which men have preached for about eighteen hundred years and just in proportion as their belief in that religion has grown great men have grown mean and wicked just in proportion as they have ceased to believe it men have become just and charitable and if they believe it to-night as they once believed it i wouldn't be allowed to speak in the city of new york it is from the coldness and infidelity of the churches that i get my right to preach and i say it to their credit now we have a religion what is it 
They say in the first place that all this vast universe was created by a deity. I don't know whether it was or not. They say, too, that had it not been for the first sin of Adam, there would never have been any devil in this world. And if there had been no devil, there would have been no sin. And if there had been no sin, there never would have been any death. For my part, I am glad there was somebody had to die to give me room. And when my turn comes, I'll be willing to let somebody else take my place. But whether there is another life or not, if there is any being who gave me this, I shall thank him from the bottom of my heart, because upon the whole my life has been a joy. Now they say because of this first sin all men were consigned to eternal hell, and this because Adam was our representative. Well, I always had an idea that my representative ought to live somewhere about the same time I do. I always had an idea that I should have some voice in choosing my representative. And if I had a voice, I never should have voted for the old gentleman called Adam. Now, in order to regain man from the frightful hell of eternity, Christ himself came to this world and took upon himself flesh. And in order that we might know the road to eternal salvation, he gave us a book. And that book is called the Bible. And whenever that Bible has been read, men have immediately commenced cutting each other's throats. Wherever that Bible has been circulated, they have invented inquisitions and instruments of torture, and they commenced hating each other with all their hearts. But I am told now, we are all told, that this Bible is the foundation of civilization. But I say that this Bible is the foundation of hell. And we shall never get rid of the dogma of hell until we get rid of the idea that it is an inspired book. Now, what does the Bible teach? I am not going to talk about what this minister or that minister says it teaches. The question is, ought a man to be sent to eternal hell for not believing this Bible to be the work of a merciful father? And the only way to find out is to read it. And a very few people do read it now. I will read a few passages. This is the book to be read in the schools in order to make our children charitable and good. This is the book that we must read in order that our children may have ideas of mercy, charity, and justice. Does the Bible teach mercy? Now be honest. I read... I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and the sword shall devour flesh. Deuteronomy 32, 42. Pretty good start for a merciful God. That thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies, and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. Psalms 98, 23. Again, and the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. Deuteronomy 7, 22. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee, until thou have destroyed them. Deuteronomy 7, 23 and 24. So Joshua came, and all the people of war with him, against them by waters of Merom suddenly, and they fell upon them. And the Lord delivered them into the land of Israel, who smote them, and chased them into the great Zidon, and into Misrephothimeam, and unto the valley of Mizpeth eastward. And they smote them, until they left them none remaining. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hewed their horses, and burnt their chariots with fire. And Joshua at that time turned back, and took Hazor, and smote the king thereof with the sword. For Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms. And they smote all the souls that were therein, with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe. And he burnt Hazor with fire. 
and all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword and he utterly destroyed them as moses the servant of the lord commanded but as for the cities that stood still in their strength israel burnt none of them save hazor only that did joshua burn and all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of israel took for a prey unto themselves but every man they smote with the edge of the sword brave until they had destroyed them neither left they any to breathe as the moral god had commanded them as the lord commanded moses his servant so did moses command joshua and so did joshua he left nothing undone of all that the lord commanded moses so joshua took all that land the hills and all the south country and all the land of goshen and the valley of the same even from the mount halak that goeth up to seir even unto Balgad in the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took, and smote them, and slew them. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hevites, the inhabitants of Gideon. All other they took in battle. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them, as the Lord commanded Moses. And at that time came Joshua, and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debit, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities there was none of the anakims left in the land of the children of israel only in gaza in gath and in ashdod there remained so joshua took the whole land according to all that the lord said unto moses and joshua gave it for an inheritance unto israel according to their divisions by their tribes and the land rested from war joshua eleven seven to twenty three when thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it then proclaim peace unto it and if it shall be if it make thee answer of peace and open unto thee then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee and they shall serve thee and if it will make no peace with thee but will make war against thee then thou shalt besiege it and when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women, and the little ones, and the cattle, and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself, and thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God hath given thee thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee which are not of the cities of these nations but of the cities of these people which the lord thy god doth give thee for an inheritance thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth but thou shalt utterly destroy them deuteronomy twenty ten through seventeen neither the old men nor the women nor the maidens nor the sweet dimpled babe smiling upon the lap of his mother were to be spared and he said unto them thus saith the lord god of israel a merciful god indeed put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor Exodus thirty two twenty seven. Now recollect, these instructions were given to an army of invasion, and the people who were slayed were guilty of the crime of fighting for their homes. Oh, most merciful God! The Old Testament is full of curses, vengeance, jealousy, and hatred, and of barbarity and brutality now do you not for one moment believe that these words were written by the most merciful god don't pluck from the heart the sweet flowers of piety and crush them by superstition do not believe that god ever ordained the murder of innocent women and helpless babes 
do not let this supposition turn your hearts into stone when anything is said to have been written by the most merciful god and the thing is not merciful then i deny it and say he never wrote it i will live by the standard of reason and if thinking in accordance with reason takes me to perdition then i will go to hell with my reason rather than to heaven without it now does this bible teach political freedom or does it teach political tyranny does it teach a man to resist oppression does it teach a man to tear from the throne of tyranny the crowned thing and robber called a king let us see let every soul be subject to the higher powers for there is no power but of god the powers that are ordained of god romans twelve one all the kings and princes and governors and thieves and robbers that happened to be in authority were placed there by the infinite father of all whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of god and when george washington resisted the power of george the third he resisted the power of god and when our fathers said resistance to tyrants is obedience to god they falsified the bible itself for he is the minister of god to thee for good but if thou do that which is evil be afraid for he beareth not the sword in vain for he is the minister of god revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath but also for conscience sake romans thirteen four and five i deny this wretched doctrine wherever the sword of rebellion is drawn to protect the rights of man i am a rebel wherever the sword of rebellion is drawn to give man liberty to clothe him in all his just rights i am on the side of that rebellion i deny that the rulers are crowned by the most high the rulers are the people and the presidents and others are but the servants of the people all authority comes from the people and not from the aristocracy of the air upon these texts of scripture which i have just read rest the thrones of europe and these are the voices that are repeated from age to age by brainless kings and heartless kings does the bible give woman her rights is this bible humane does it treat woman as she ought to be treated or is it barbarian let us see let the woman learn in silence with all subjection one timothy two eleven if a woman would know anything let her ask her husband Im imagine the ignorance of a lady who had only that source of information but i suffer not a woman to teach not to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence for adam was first formed then eve what magnificent reason and adam was not deceived but the woman being deceived was in the transgression splendid but i would have you know that the head of every man is christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of christ is god that is to say there is as much difference between the woman and man as there is between christ and man this is the liberty of woman for the man is not of the woman but the woman is of the man it was the man's cut till that was taken not the woman's neither was the man created for the woman well what was he created for but the woman was created for the man wives submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the lord there's liberty for the husband is the head of the wife even as christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body therefore as the church is subject unto christ so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything good again even the savior didn't put man and woman upon an equality the man could divorce the wife but the wife could not divorce the husband and according to the old testament the mother had to ask for forgiveness for being the mother of babes splendid 
here is something from the old testament when thou goest forth to war against thine enemies and the lord thy god hath delivered them into thine hands and thou hast taken them captive and seest among the captives a beautiful woman and has a desire unto her that thou wouldst have her to thy wife then thou shalt bring her to thine house and she shall shave her head and pare her nails deuteronomy twenty one ten through twelve that is in self-defense i suppose this sacred book this foundation of human liberty of morality does it teach concubinage and polygamy read the thirty-first chapter of numbers read the twenty-first chapter of deuteronomy read the blessed lives of abraham of david or of solomon and then tell me that the sacred scripture does not teach polygamy and concubinage all the language of the world is not sufficient to express the infamy of polygamy it makes a man a beast and woman a stone it destroys the fireside and makes virtue an outcast and yet it is the doctrine of the bible the doctrine defended by luther and melanchthon it takes from our language those sweetest words father husband wife and mother and takes us back to barbarism and fills our hearts with the crawling slimy serpents of loathsome lust does the bible teach the existence of devils of course it does yes it teaches not only the existence of a good being but a bad being this good being had to have a home that home was heaven this bad being had to have a home and that home was hell this hell is supposed to be nearer to earth than i would care to have it and to be peopled with spirits spooks hobgoblins and all the fiery shapes with which the imagination of ignorance and fear could people that horrible place and the bible teaches the existence of hell and this big devil and all these little devils the bible teaches the doctrine of witchcraft and makes us believe that there are sorcerers and witches and that the dead could be raised by the power of sorcery does anybody believe it now then said saul unto his servants seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit that i may go to her and inquire of her and his servants said to him behold there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at endor and saul disguised himself and put on other raiment and he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night and he said i pray thee divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom i shall name unto thee that was a pretty good spiritual seance and the woman said unto him behold thou knowest what saul hath done how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die and saul sware to her by the lord saying as the lord liveth there shall be no punishment happen to thee for this thing then said the woman whom shall i bring up unto thee and he said bring me up samuel and when the woman saw samuel she cried with a loud voice and the woman spoke to saul saying why hast thou deceived me for thou art saul and the king said unto her be not afraid for what sawest thou and the woman said unto saul i saw gods ascending out of the earth and he said unto her what form is he of and she said an old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle and saul perceived that it was samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself one samuel twenty eight seven through fourteen in another place he declares that witchcraft is an abomination unto the lord he wanted no rivals in this business now what does the new testament teach then was jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and when he had fasted forty days and forty nights he was afterward and hungered and when the tempter came to him he said if thou be the son of god command that these stones be made bread but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, 
and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, hell cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Matthew 4, 1-7 is it possible that any one can believe that the devil absolutely took god almighty and put him on the pinnacle of the temple and endeavored to persuade him to jump down is it possible again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him all these things will i give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4, 8-10 through 10. Now the devil must have known at that time that he was God, and God at that time must have known that the other was the devil. How could the latter be conceived to have the impudence to promise God a world in which he did not have a tax title to an inch of land? Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Matthew 4:11 and they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the gadarenes and when he was come out of the ship immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him no not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces neither could any man tame him and always night and day he was in the mountains and tombs crying and cutting himself with stones but when he saw jesus afar off he came and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said what have i to do with thee jesus thou son of the most high god i adjure thee by god that thou torment me not for he said unto him come out of the man thou unclean spirit and he asked him what is thy name and he answered saying my name is legion for we are many and he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding and all the devils besought him saying send us into the swine that we may enter into them and forthwith jesus gave them leave and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea they were about two thousand and were choked in the sea mark five one through thirteen now i will ask a question should reasonable men in the nineteenth century in the united states of america believe that that was an actual occurrence if my salvation depends upon believing that i am lost i have never experienced the signs by which it is said a believer may be known i deny all the witch stories in this world these fables of devils have covered the world with blood they have filled the world with fear and i am going to do what i can to free the world of these insatiate monsters small and great they have filled the world with monsters they have made the world a synonym of liar and ferocity and it is this book that ought to be read in all the schools, this book that teaches man to enslave his brother. If it is larceny to steal the result of labor, how much more is it larceny to steal the laborer himself? Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land and they shall be your possession and ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them for a possession they shall be your bondmen for ever but over your brethren the children of israel ye shall not rule one over another with rigor leviticus twenty five forty five forty six why because they are not as good as you will buy of the heathen roundabout now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them 
if thou buy an hebrew servant six years shall he serve and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing if he came in by himself he shall go out by himself if he were married then his wife shall go out with him if his master have given him a wife and she have borne him sons or daughters the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself if the servant shall plainly say i love my master my wife and my children i will not go out free then his master shall bring him unto the judges he shall also bring him to the door or unto the door-post and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl and he shall serve him for ever exodus twenty one one through six this is the doctrine which has ever lent itself to the chains of slavery and makes a man imprison himself rather than desert his wife and children i hate it now listen to the new testament the tidings of great joy for all people servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto christ not with eye service as men pleases but as the servants of christ doing the will of god from the heart ephesians six five and six splendid doctrine servants be subject to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle but also to the forward for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards god endure grief suffering wrongfully one peter two eighteen and nineteen servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh he was afraid they might not work all the time so he adds not with the eye service as men pleases but in the singleness of heart fearing god read the twenty-first chapter of exodus seven to eleven and if a man sell his daughter to be a maid-servant she shall not go out as the men servants do if she please not her master who hath betrothed her to himself then shall he let her be redeemed to sell her unto a strange nation he shall have no power seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her and if he have betrothed her unto his son he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters if he take him another wife her food her raiment and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish and if he do not these three unto her then shall she go out free without money servants be obedient to your masters is the salutation of the most merciful god to one who works for nothing and who receives upon his naked back the lash as legal tender for service performed servants be obedient to your masters is the salutation of the most merciful god to the slave mother bending over her infant's grave servants be obedient to your masters is the salutation to a man endeavoring to escape pursuit followed by savage bloodhounds and with his eye fixed upon the northern star this book ought to be read in the schools so that our children will love liberty what does this same book say of the rights of little children let us see how they are treated by the most merciful god if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them then shall his father and his mother lay hold of him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place and they shall say unto the elders of his city this our son is stubborn and rebellious he will not obey our voice he is a glutton and a drunkard and all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die so shalt thou put evil away from among you and all israel shall hear and fear deuteronomy twenty one eighteen through twenty one abraham was commanded to offer his son isaac as a sacrifice and he intended to obey the boy was not consulted did you ever hear the story of jephthah's daughter returning him jephthah said and jephthah vowed a vow unto the lord and said if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of ammon into mine hands then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when i return in peace from the children of ammon shall surely be the lord's and i will offer it up for a burnt offering 
so jephthah passed over into the children of ammon to fight against them and the lord delivered them into his hands and he smote them from aroer even till thou come to minith even twenty cities and unto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter thus the children of ammon were subdued before the children of israel and Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and, behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dance, and she was his only child. Besides her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass, when he saw her, that he rent his clothes, and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, forasmuch as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even to the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains, and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions, and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass, at the end of two months, that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. Is there in the history of the world a sadder story than this? Can a God who would accept such a sacrifice be worthy of the worship of civilized men? I believe in the rights of children. I plead for the republic of home, for the democracy of the fireside, and for this I am called a heathen and a devil by those who believe in the cheerful and comforting doctrine of eternal damnation. Read the book of Job. Read that God met the devil, and asked him where he had been, and he said, Walking up and down the country. And the Lord said to him, Have you noticed my man Job over there, how good he is? And the devil said, Of course he's good. You give him everything he wants. Just take away his property, and he'll curse you. You just try it. And he did try it, and took away his goods. But Job still remained good. The devil laughed and said he had not been tried enough. Then the Lord touched his flesh, but he was still true. Then he took away his children, but he remained faithful. And in the end, to show how much Job made by his fidelity, his property was all doubled, and he had more children than ever. If you have a child and you love it, would you be satisfied with a God who would destroy it? and endeavor to make it up by giving you another that was better looking? No! You want that one! You want no other! And yet this is the idea of the love of children taught in the Bible. End of Part 1 of Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.